Hello and welcome to the G0 OZS radio channel. This is a new departure for me. It's not a video about a vintage military radio. It's a copy of a presentation I did to the Leiston Amateur Radio Club and East Suffolk Raynet on the 13th of April covering electromagnetic fields and the ICNIRP limits that will be applied as part of the UK Amateur Radio Licence effective from May 2021. The slides that follow with voiceover are what I presented, although I've slightly edited it to remove potential copyright issues with screenshots of some of the resources that I have mentioned. I've replaced those with links to the original in this version. So if you are an amateur radio operator in the UK, the following slides may be useful. They are my personal view of the changes to the UK amateur radio license and are not approved by any organization of which I may be a member or have presented it to. So everything is entirely my own and not an official presentation on behalf of anyone. Enjoy. This presentation is an introduction to the ICNIRP guidelines as applied to amateur radio in the United Kingdom. This presentation represents my best current understanding of the evolving requirements for EMF assessment and recording and the tools available for doing so by radio amateurs in the United Kingdom as of early April 2021. This has been prepared in a private capacity and does not represent the views of and has not been endorsed by my employer, the RSDB, any radio club to whom I may present these slides, or Rainer UK. Please follow the RSDB, ARRL and Ofcom links in these slides for current information, especially if you're looking at these slides weeks, months or years after they were prepared. Before we start, the most important thing is not to be unduly alarmed. If I wasn't worried about copyright, I would find a keep operating and carry on type of graphic for this. My experience of going through the process so far is it's 70% documentation, 20% engineering in the sense of minor tweaks to get things further away like raising the ends of an inverted V dipole. And 10% is not doing things or doing things in a very different way, like maybe not using resonant uh, radials, resonant counterpoise wires in special event stations where people might get near them. So what will we cover? I'm going to talk about what electromagnetic fields are, what IC and IRP is, what Ofcom's new requirements are, both in terms of the new license condition and the guidance that it includes by reference. I'm going to discuss the tools that are available to demonstrate compliance and provide a flowchart for attempting to prove compliance by the easiest available method. And I'm going to suggest options if your station cannot comply within the space available. So what are electromagnetic fields? An electric field is produced by an electric charge or a voltage in a wire. It's measured in volts per meter, written Vm minus 1 or V slash M. A magnetic field is produced by magnets or a current in a wire. It is measured in amps per meter, written AM minus 1, or A slash M. Radio waves consist of linked electric and magnetic fields propagating at right angles to each other and the direction of propagation. These fields carry power which spreads out through space 
leading to the inverse square law. And power density is measured in watts per square meter written at Wm minus 2, or W slash M squared. Antennas create radio waves using a system of conductors such that the electric and magnetic fields combine at a distance to create a radio wave. This is called the far field. Close to the antenna, the fields need to be measured or plotted separately. This is the near field. The antenna can be considered as a point source if you are far enough away to be in the far field, which in practice is two or three wavelengths. The contributions of individual elements need to be added up at each location nearer to the antenna to arrive at the total E or H fields at that particular spot. If we look at the far field plots of an inverted V dipole, what we find is if it's near to the ground, it's quite omnidirectional in the horizontal plane and has a surprising amount of gain straight up, which is why it's good for near vertical incident sky wave. The near field plots look nothing like that. We have a high voltage at the open ends of the dipole, and that results in high E fields. We have a high current near the feed point in the middle that results in high magnetic fields in the middle. Note that they're not in the same places. The high electric and the high magnetic fields are as far apart as they can be. ICNIRP exists because electromagnetic fields have biological effects and it is necessary to protect people who are near transmitters. The obvious effect, which we're familiar with from the kitchen, is heating, because we all probably have a microwave cooker at home. There are also induced currents in arms and legs, particularly acting as antennas. And because our nervous system is electrochemical in nature, there is a possibility of nerve stimulation, particularly with low frequency and extra low frequency electromagnetic fields. So what is ICNIRP? It's the International Committee for Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, based in Munich. So what is ICNIRP? It's a organization formed of health physicists interested in non-ionizing, that's to say non-nuclear radiation, such as radio waves. It publishes guidelines at the links given and in the journal Health Physics. It covers effects due to heating, changes to cell biology, and electrostimulation of nerves below 10 megahertz. There are separate limits for the general public and occupational exposure. Occupational exposure is people who own the antenna or are paid to go near it. General public is everyone else. Occupational levels are usually double the public levels. The limits are stated in terms of separate E and H fields at low frequencies below 30 megahertz. And in terms of power density in watts per square meter, at above 30 megahertz, although equivalent E and H fields are available up to 2 gigahertz. There are three versions which are progressively less severe in most respects from 1998, 2010 and 2020. Looking at the comparison graph from ICNIRP, the red line is 1998 which is the lowest for the electric field. The green line raised the limits above about 2 megahertz to 10 megahertz in 2010. And the blue line raised the E field limit again uh, below 30 megahertz in 2020. There is a gotcha, which we'll come to in a, a minute. So in reality, the green line is still about the real limit below 10 megahertz.
ICNIRP 2020 Table 6 is the table for 6 minute exposure from 100 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. And the bit in the green box is the general public level. With the exception of the VHF range, where there are constant 62 volts per meter and 0.163 amps per meter, or 10 watts per square meter limits, everything else is related to frequency. Uh, so it's easier to work with a table uh, of pre-calculated limits for each amateur band. Table 5 gives 30-minute levels at 44% of the 6-minute levels. That's probably relevant to me as a GB2RS reader and to repeater keepers, but not much other amateur activity. The gotcha I mentioned earlier is the reference levels for 100 kilohertz to 10 megahertz have a lower constant E field strength of 83 volts per meter due to electrostimulation. In general, this is lower than table six below 10 megahertz, which is the reason that a lot of the calculators don't offer an answer below 10 megahertz anymore. And it's also the reason that in general the E field is what actually determines the separation distance rather than the H field in the low HF range. I've prepared a table of the ICNIRP 2020 limits from table 8 below 10 megahertz and table 6 above. Uh, as a ready reckoner by band to save having to try and read the graph. And there is something similar to this inside the Ofcom and RSGB calculators. So if we happen to be on 40 meters, we can see that it's 83 volts per meter E, 0.69 amps per meter H, for example. IC and IRP power limits are averages above 10 megahertz. Below 10 megahertz, the PQ field matters, so we use PEP, and we don't care about how much of the time the transmitter is active. Above 10 megahertz, the limits are six minute averages rather than peak, so we can consider the transmit receive ratio. Less transmitting means lower average power. And within the transmit receive periods, we can consider the average power for the mode. So FM is the highest. SSB without compression is about the lowest. I think possibly APRS beacons might trump that. The RSUB calculator does the averaging for you. Don't overestimate the transmit receive ratio and mode factor. Only net control stations or one on one QSOs are near to a equal transmit and receive ratio 50%. If overs are short, you should divide the power by the number of stations in the net. I think that applies particularly if it's just type reports and call signs length overs. If you're talking for longer than that, use the percentage of six minutes taken by each over. So you're talking for two minutes, it's a third, or 33%. Only FM and data modes have 100% transmitted power throughout and over. Morse is about 40%. SSB will be 20 to 40%, depending on the compression and gaps in speech. The average power is the electrical power multiplied by the transmit receive ratio multiplied by the mode factor. So in a 14 megahertz SSB net with five stations and short overs, the average is 20% for the five stations of 40% for processed SSB, which is 8% of the metered PEP. In other words, much less than you might first expect. And the RSGB have kindly provided a table of the various mode factors in their spreadsheet, which you can examine and reuse as required.
ICNIRP uses effective isotropically radiated power. EIRP is affected by antenna gain. Bear in mind that antenna gain is directional, so the peak power is where the antenna is pointing. The power and fields are less in all other directions. The RSUB and Ofcom calculators give the separation in the direction of maximum gain. Other calculators do correct for this and allow you to see the separation above, below and behind the antenna as well as directly in front. The antenna gain and radiated power are expressed in DBI or DBD. DBI and EIRP are relative to a spherical radiator, one that radiates equally up, down, left, right, backwards and forwards, and the sun or an old-fashioned light bulb are the nearest things I can think of that do that. DBD and ERP are relative to a dipole which radiates mostly sideways or around the middle. There is a fixed ratio of 10 over 6 or 2.15 dB between DBI and DBD. DBI equals DBD plus 2.15 and DBD equals DBI minus 2.15. Dealers in antennas generally specify the antenna gains in DBI because it's a bigger number. Be sure to start from ERP if it is given in DBD or EIRP if it is given in DBI and don't double correct. The Ofcom calculator starts with the average EIRP. And I've prepared a table to allow the conversion of the electrical power and the antenna gain in DBI or DBD to the EIRP for Ofcom. So if we look at the case of 6.1 watts electrical power and a DBI gain of 2.15, which is a dipole, zero DBD, we get 10 watts. And that's the reason that the Ofcom guidelines specify 6.1 watts uh, electrical or ERP and 10 watts EIRP. So let's have a look at the new Ofcom condition and its associated guidelines as they apply to amateur radio. Ofcom is the radio regulator in the United Kingdom. They propose to add an EMF condition referencing ICNIRP to all licenses in May 2021. The three links at the top of this page cover their introduction to what they're doing and the links for specific new amateur license terms and conditions which have yellow highlighting for what is changing and the compliance and enforcement guidance document which is included by reference in the license terms and conditions. They have provided two resources specific to helping amateur radio operators assess their compliance. The first is the spreadsheet calculator and the second is a guidance document for radio amateurs which has a flow chart of what you need to do on page three a table of pre-calculated distances by power and band on page 10, which I have validated with their calculator, and some examples which perhaps could have done with more proofreading on page 11. Hopefully by the time you get to read these, they will have been fixed, so I won't mention them anymore. So what exactly are Ofcom changing? They propose to add a new Clause 7.1c and Schedule 3 to the UK Amateur Radio Licence. Clause 7.1c just says to follow the requirements of Schedule 3. Schedule 3 specifies the ICNIRP limits to be applied, which are 1998 Table 7 or 2020 Tables 5 through 9. Schedule 3 Clause 7 incorporates the Ofcom guidance by reference, so in reality it is more than guidance, it has the force of the license. It requires local records to be available for inspection by Ofcom, 
but does not prescribe the formal content of these records in detail. So you have some flexibility in how those records are created and kept. What they must do is explain how you are complying with the ICNIRP guidelines and can prove that you have done so. Specifically, the Ofcom guidance exempts transmitters below 10.1 watts EIRP, i.e. after antenna gain is taken into account. It includes family members, guests and lodgers as part of the general public. It exempts amateur radio licensees working together, for example, at a field day. It exempts shared sites below a total power of 100 watts from the licensee's own equipment from extra rules that are otherwise applied to multi-operator sites. It defines and excludes areas where the public can be presumed not to be present. It lists methods of demonstrating and recording compliance that are acceptable to Ofcom. It lists methods of mitigating the risk to the general public, including distance, locked gates, and signage. And it confirms that Ofcom accept operator settings as apart from physical power limits and average power calculations as mitigation for frequencies where average power is appropriate. The pre-calculated Ofcom table is stated in their document to have been prepared using the calculator. So I've reproduced that here using the calculator myself and added rows and columns for the 21 and 70 megahertz bands and additional power levels at 200 and 300 watts. We now need to consider how we demonstrate compliance in a form that can be recorded. There are a number of ways of demonstrating compliance. In order of increasing difficulty as I see it, you can use low power and low gain antennas. You can avoid the general public. You can use Ofcom's calculator or one derived from it to establish the separation distance. You can use published tables for antennas below 10 megahertz or you can use antenna modeling software to map the fields around your antenna in sufficient detail to know where the exclusion zone, if there is one, should be. I've produced a flowchart for assessing compliance. So we start by calculating the average EIRP. If the EIRP is not greater than 10 watts, then we are OK. Stop here and record it, how you arrived at that. If it is greater than 10 watts, then is the public access. So if we're on a round the world voyage on our own, then there's no public access. And that is a good reason to be, say you're compliant. If there is public access, then first step is to use the Ofcom or RSGB calculator. And if that gives a separation distance that you can achieve with your current station, record that and you are compliant and can prove it. If it doesn't achieve the separation that's required, you can modify your station or you can try to use a more refined calculator. If it is a HF station, then you can look in the ARRL RF Exposure and U book. If your antenna is in the book, you can look at the table and see what separation is required. And if the separation is compatible with your existing station, record it and you are OK. If the book does not give a sufficient separation or does not include your antenna, then you need to look at preparing a map of the fields around your antenna using something like NEC. If that shows you can achieve sufficient separation, keep the map and the NEC model and record it and you are okay. 
If you are on VHF, I'd suggest to use the IARU Region 1 calculator, which is aware of antenna patterns. If that shows, you can achieve the separation required having regard to the antenna pattern in the directions where people could actually be, then record it and you are OK. If not, then you need to go back to modeling software and NEC. If all else fails, then you need to modify the station. And once you've uh, got a taller mast or changed your antenna or moved the mast, go through the whole process again. And if it then gives a compliant answer, well and good. If it doesn't, keep iterating until it does. There are a number of things you can do to avoid multiple calculations. If you calculate for the highest power setting of your transmitter, so if you have a mobile transmitter that does 5, 15, and 50 watts, calculate for 50, and that separation will be more than enough for any lower power in the same antenna. If you calculate for the lowest height of antenna that will just work, then any additional height will be an improvement. For simple antennas, Ofcom gives a slightly greater separation distance for the same type of antenna at 2 meters and 70 centimeters for equal gain. So a 2 meter calculation for a quarter wave vertical will cover a 70 centimeter quarter wave vertical mounted in the same place. And for HF wire antennas below 10 megahertz, in every case I've looked at so far, the E field limit has been greater than the H field limit. So modeling the H field limit is rather less necessary. The simplest way to demonstrate compliance is to show that your effective isotropically radiated power is less than 10 watts. Ofcom exempt stations with EIRP less than 10 watts from having to assess the antenna and separation distance requirements in guideline 6.5a. This can be achieved by choosing a radio and antenna so as to make it physically impossible to exceed the 10 watt limit, or by setting up and installing the radio and antenna so that they will operate below 10 watts EIRP. And above 10 megahertz, you can restrict the operating parameters of your station to bring the six minute average power below 10 watts. This can be achieved, for example, by programming a code plug to allow only compliant output power with your antenna, by buying a radio and antenna incapable of exceeding the power limit. So most handhelds with a rubber duck antenna, if they transmit five watts electrically, will have less than dipole gain, so they're guaranteed to achieve that. Note in the log that you have set the power switch to low or medium power. I mean, most people record power in the log anyway. Uh, and you can calculate the power times antenna gain times modulation factor to be less than 10 watts, which works for SSB in quite a lot of configurations, even at 50 watts PEP. And you can keep a low transmit receive ratio as in guideline 6.8, by the use of timeout timers or manually sticking to short overs. I've prepared a summary sheet showing how all my radios can be used without an antenna assessment under guideline 6.5a, either by design or with power and duty cycle limits. And this is the table I mentioned. In general, for the radios with five watt output, there are no special conditions for compliance using their own aerials or simple external aerials. For the larger radios, they generally are OK on their lowest power setting and require transmit receive ratio limits on higher powers. The only real exceptions are the large HF sets operating above 100 watts, which 
need assessment under all circumstances and the medium power HF radios which need assessment below 10 megahertz. So let's look at some calculators. The Ofcom calculator comes from their website. I'd suggest using the first link because they keep updating it uh, and it's probably better to always use the latest version at the time of preparing your compliance records. It's an Excel sheet. It is meant to run in Microsoft Office. It's reputed to run in Google Docs and OpenOffice, although I haven't tried it. It treats the antenna as a point source. You only have to put in the EIRP and frequency as the inputs of the burden of calculating the transmitter power times modulation factor times antenna gain is down to you. It uses the ICNIRP 1998 formula to determine the limits, and it does not give results below 10 megahertz. The separation given is a straight line from the general public to the antenna, and it is good for VHF if you know your EIRP. Use it with care if the reactive near field distance which it shows gets close to the separation distance. At that point, you really need to use a more advanced calculator to get credible results. It will overestimate in the sort of 14 megahertz or 21 megahertz range particularly. As I mentioned earlier, Ofcom have produced a table of pre-calculated values in their guidance for radio amateurs. To use it, there is a two-stage process. Use my lookup table or well-known formulae to get the EIRP from the electrical power and antenna gain, and then use that EIRP and the band to get a conservative separation distance. This may be useful to get together with the gain and EIRP table for field use, and I've given an example for a 50 watt FM transmitter on two meters with a dipole antenna. The first stage is to find out the gain of the antenna. The easy way is to look at the data sheet or manual if it's available, but make sure you know whether the gain given there is in DBI or DVD. For standard antenna types, you may also be able to get the gain from a textbook or from the tables in the RSGB and IARU Region 1 calculators. Once you know the gain of your antenna and the power of your transmitter, you can either calculate the EIRP or you can use my table. To use my table, look down from the gain of the antenna until you find the row matching the power of your transmitter. Where they cross, you will find the EIRP, which in this case 50 watts and 2.15 dBi for a dipole gives 82 watts EIRP. Once we know the EIRP and the band in use, we can use the Ofcom table from their guidance note. We first look for the next power column above the EIRP, which is 100 watts here, and look down to the band, which is 144 megahertz here. That row and column cross where the separation is shown at 3.2 meters. So the conservative Ofcom separation distance for this particular station is 3.2 meters from anywhere anyone can touch or be. If the Ofcom table does not meet your needs, for example, because you are operating on a different band or at a power level too far between the columns, then you need to use the spreadsheet calculator yourself. To do this, you input the transmitter EIRP and the operating frequency. You read off the separation distance 
and check that the separation distance is greater than the reactive near field zone. This is an example for my normal GB2RS station, which is a 80 watt amplifier with a 6 dBi two element Yagi. And that gives a separation of just under six meters, which is fine because I use a 10 meter mast on windy days and 13 meters on not so windy days. At HF, the Ofcom calculator gives rather large separations. This is an example for a 100 watt electrical station, 164 watt CIRP from a dipole. It requires a separation of 4 meters on 14 megahertz, but also says the reactive near field zone is 3.41 meters, so we know that will be a little bit too conservative. Ofcom, in the version available in early April 2021, will not give an answer below 10 megahertz. Uh, so if we try the same values power at 7 megahertz, it will say invalid input rather than give a separation distance. The RSGB calculator comes from their website. It tracks the version of the Ofcom calculator and it actually uses the Ofcom calculator as its core. It adds the antenna, feeder, and average power calculations to get an EIRP to go into Ofcom, and it converts a separation distance given a mast height into horizontal and vertical distances, which are easier to work with thinking about barriers or other uh, ways to keep people away. It takes a lot of inputs, the band, the mode, the power, the transmit receive ratio, the antenna, the feeder, and the antenna height. It's designed to be printed and kept as a compliance record. And as it is based on the Ofcom calculator, it is likewise pessimistic in the lower or mid HF range. So here's an example, which is probably particularly relevant to Raynet mobile stations, a VHF mobile running 50 watts FM on two meters. We'll assume a 20% transmit to receive ratio, a little more than one minute in six. We'll give it a five meter feeder of RG58, which should be enough to reach a mag mount on the roof. We'll use a quarter wave antenna, which is perhaps a bit low gain. Uh, and we'll give it a height of 1.5 meters, which is a typical car roof. And if we do the calculations, we end up with a compliance distance of 1.1 meters. If you put the antenna in the car roof, the car's probably not quite wide enough to have 1.1 meters from the center of the roof to the gutter, but it's certainly more than 1.1 meters from the center of the roof to the white lines on a UK single carriageway, which has to be at least five and a half meters wide. So you work out center of car to center to the white lines, assuming you're centered in the lanes, is about 1.375 meters. So that's compliant for mobile operation is probably okay in a car park if you do something like leave a door open to stop people walking close past the car or squeezing between your car and the next one. If we look at a similar setup on 70 centimeters, we have slightly more feeder loss. Uh, it was about 0.9 dB on two meters. It's gone up to 1.7 dB on 70 centimeters, and that's actually brought the average EIRP below 10 watts, so it's compliant without regard to distance. It does still quote a separation distance, which is 0.9 meters. The next example is a Raynet control station using a 50 watt transmitter 
with a 50% duty cycle. In other words, control is talking half the time. And we give them 10 meters of decent coax and an antenna six meters off the ground. And what we find here is that we have an Ofcom separation of 3.9 meters. And we have 10 centimeters to spare, which is a miss is as good as a mile, it's okay. And obviously any higher mast will be better. If we look at an intermediate licensee operating on 20 meters with a 40 meter feeder to a half wave dipole at 50 watts, 40% transmit receive, so almost as much transmit as received, just allowing for gaps between overs. And we find that the average EIRP in that case is 10 watts, and we don't have to worry about separation distances at all. Below 10 megahertz, the RSGB calculator presents effectively the same answer as Ofcom in a slightly more pleasant way. So it says not valid and gives the reactive near field zone of 13.1 meters for a 80 meter station running 250 watts. It would give the same near field distance, whatever power you put in. And that is a sign that you need to use a more advanced method of calculation rather than that you need to keep people 13 meters away from the antenna. If we look at our high power HF station on 20 meters, then say if I run my 250 watt transmitter at 40% transmit receive ratio, With processed SSB, 20 meters of RG58 feeder and a half wave dipole six meters off the ground, then it tells me that the Ofcom compliance distance and the reactive near field zone are both 3.4 meters. The vertical separation for a 1.8 meter tall person is 4.2 meters, so we're well to the good and we could actually go to the invert an inverted V configuration with the ends considerably lower before we had any great problems. Uh, in general, if the separation is greater than the compliance distance, then the antenna is okay. A final comment on the RSGB calculator is that there is a shaded box below the separations where you can type anything you want. I use that to record more details of the antenna than can be filled in above. And I manually calculate the safety margin, which is the vertical separation minus the Ofcom compliance distance, uh, which it would be nice if the sheet did for us, since that's the real safety margin. I also usually make notes to say that this has been calculated for the highest power of this configuration and use of lower power or lower transmit percentage will increase the safety margin. And that saves me doing lots of copies of the same sheet, I hope. If we find that the separation distance required for our station is not feasible, what can we do to improve it? If the calculators do not show that our existing station is compliant, there are a number of things that we can do to improve the situation. We can reduce power. We can use modes that are more efficient with less power. We can use a taller mast, which also makes up for reduced power to a large extent. We can point a beam antenna away from public areas. We can operate when the public are sure to be out. We can provide warning of public entry to hazard areas so we can stop transmitting. 
We can put up warning signs or barriers, and we can use more accurate calculations to reduce the exclusion zone to the minimum necessary. Raising the antenna is one of the easiest ways to improve separation. The inverse square law applies to separation distances in the far field. So a large increase in power requires a small increase in separation. And conversely, a small increase in separation allows much more power. The easiest way to increase separation is upwards. Five meters is enough for any reasonable portable VHS setup used for Rainit and the like. It's easy to construct simple unguide masts to get a VHF antenna five meters off the ground. Antennas have gain in the vertical plane, so raising the main beam above head height helps. This is not fully accounted for by the Ofcom and RSGB calculators because they give separation in the direction of maximum antenna gain. The IARU program does do that, at least for commercial antennas that it's got vertical patterns for. And if you can do that, you can probably reduce the height required quite significantly. There is a bonus in that higher antennas give you longer range, especially on VHF, and that offsets the effect of reduced power. So it's a win-win, a little less power, a little more height will probably solve most problems. We should avoid pointing antennas at the public. Directional antennas need more separation in the direction of maximum gain, but if we know where that is, less separation is needed in other directions. The Ofcom and RSGB calculators don't give you a lot of help in doing that. The IARU, IC and IRP calc will do that if you can find a model that fits your antenna that has angle data. And if you look at an extreme case of high gain vertically polarized antennas, which have very flat patterns, the two examples in ICNIRP are the Diamond X30, which is 3 dBi, and the Diamond X700, which gives you 9.3 dBi on two meters. And you can see that the vertical separation is hardly any different at 60 degrees down from the horizontal. But the horizontal separation increases from 1.3 meters to 2.66 meters, running 100 watts FM. So just getting a higher gain collinear actually allows you to run higher power at the same height, which is not perhaps something that you would realize using the spreadsheet calculators. There are also some non-technical solutions. You can only operate high power when the family are out and the door is locked. That's probably a solution if you have a loft antenna. You can use fences and gates with locks or alarms to exclude or warn you of people entering the area close to the antenna. That's probably particularly applicable to larger gardens that would otherwise be accessible to young people who might not read warning signs. And you can operate portable where you can either see the public approaching or there's no way they can get to you and stop transmitting if anyone comes close. That's applicable to SOTA, it's applicable to solo ocean sailors and probably open outdoor sites in general where you can see people coming. Many rain at events are also covered, so you can simply call in the number of the horse after it has uh, gone on its way. You can park where people can't get near you safely, so you might park uh, where one side of the car is protected by brambles and the other by moving traffic. You can use signs to discourage long exposure of passing pedestrians in the static mobile operation. That's what the MOD do. You'll see their Land Rovers have a do not loiter within two meters of any antenna sign stuck to them for exactly that reason. The next set of slides covers the advanced tools for modeling HF antennas or VHF antennas where directional patterns are important. The IARU Region 1 calculator is downloadable as a zip file from their website. It was written in Germany by Thilo Kutz, DL9KCE, 
and was motivated by the German implementation of ICNIRP in their license conditions several years ago. It's a Windows executable file. It's a single program with data files describing the antennas. You don't need Microsoft Office. It has a better user interface by far than the Excel sheets. It does still have some language and translation issues, particularly the antenna names are mostly still in German. It still uses basically the same maths as Ofcom, but it has a vastly better antenna library, including a lot of commercial antennas referenced by name. And it understands angles of radiation, so it gives better or more realistic results for elevated antennas, which is its main advantage in my view. This is the IARU Region 1 antenna calculator. It appears as a window with basically a left hand and a right hand half. In the left hand half, you can input the band and the power. All the other numbers are grayed out because you have to select them in other, somewhere else. There are four tabs in the right hand half, which are the antenna, the mode, the cable, and the angle. The angle table will only be there if the data is in the file for that particular antenna. So it's sometimes there and sometimes not. In the antenna tab, you can select either a generic antenna or various brands and models. And you will see some data for gain and frequency at the side. Click take antenna to use it. If you don't click that, nothing will happen. In the mode tab, you can choose a mode like CWFM, SSB. You can choose the amount of transmit versus receive time, so it offers you from 100% transmit to 1 minute in 6 transmit. And you can select the modulation factors either from the American FCC or the German BZT. Uh, we should use it FCC. In the cable type, you select the cable and its input its length. Uh, and for the antenna, you can input the antenna height above ground and in the angle table. And if there is angle data, it will also show you the effect of being directly in front of the antenna or at various positions around it on the separation distance required, which is really useful. Uh, so in this case, I've calculated for my alternative GB2RS antenna, which is a Watson W50, which is identical to a Diamond X50 at 4.5 dBi gain on 2 meters. It's 12 meters off the ground. It's fed by 20 meters of Echoflex 10 and I am using 100% duty cycle FM. And that gives me a safety distance of 2.98 meters, a bit less than with the Yagi. And interestingly, if I look at the attenuation table, sorry, at the angle table, then I see that the 2.98 meters is if I'm level with the antenna. If I'm directly underneath it, it would be 0.42 meters separation, as a more sensible angle like 60 degrees, it's 0.8 meters as near as makes no difference. So it depends on where you are relative to the antenna, how far away you need to be. And the German ICN IRP calculator gives you that information and demonstrates that if you have a high gain collinear, it actually doesn't have to be very high to not be a problem for ICNIRP. We can do calculations below 10 megahertz with the IARU Region 1 calculator, but what we find is that the near field conditions distance is much greater than the safety distance. So the answer in reality is somewhere in between. You can use the near field distance at a safety distance, but it will be 
much greater than it needs to be. Uh, and you're really much better finding a more precise calculator or using modeling software to make a map of the fields around your station below 10 megahertz. When using ICN IRP calc for VHF and UHF antennas, there are two things to watch out for. The first one is that the E field limits used are the 30 minute ones, which means that it overestimates the separation required, not by much because of the inverse square law, but it does overestimate, or conversely, it's safer than it seems. And secondly, it uses radial distances in the angle table, not straight down. And you will sometimes find that the bottom of the pattern is not directly under the antenna. You really need to click on the antenna side view to find where the minimum ground clearance actually is. With those provisos, it's actually quite useful and will certainly give you a more reasonable height requirement than tools that treat the separation distance as a sphere around the bottom of the antenna. If none of the far field calculators will give you a viable separation distance, you need to accurately calculate the separation distance or the exclusion zone in the near field of your antenna. The simple calculators from Ofcom, the RSGB and IARU use a simple formula based on ground reflection, EIRP and power density limit to arrive at a separation distance. This treats the antenna as a point source and is not valid in the inner or reactive near field zone close to the antenna. Ofcom use lambda upon 2 pi wavelength divided by 6.28, which is approximately one sixth of the wavelength for this. They tell you the reactive near field distance so you can see whether their separation distance is likely to be valid. If the separation or safety distance is less than the near field distance, then other methods must be used to map the fields inside this zone. Today, the best way to understand the electric and magnetic field strengths close to the antenna is to use electromagnetic modeling software. This produces a map of the near field strength in three dimensions. It can model nearby objects as well as the antenna and even interactions between antennas. Electromagnetic models can be used in two ways. You can find one that was done earlier, such as the pre-calculated models in the ARRL book, which are presented as tables, or you can run the software yourself. The gold standard in numerical electromagnetic modeling is NEC, the Numerical Electromagnetics Code. It came from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the USA and has been around for over 40 years with many user-friendly derivatives and workalikes now available to radio amateurs. The ARRL book is based on NEC calculations presented in the form of tables. The easy way to access NEC models for your antenna is to find a book that has them in, such as the ARRL, RF, Exposure and U, which can be freely downloaded. I understand that the RSGB is working on something similar tailored to the UK. The ARRL dealt with the introduction of IC and IRP conditions by the FCC in North America in, in the USA by producing a book called RF Exposure and U, which was based on the 1998 levels and published in 2003. 
they used the Lawrence Livermore NEC2 code. In their tables, uncontrolled is equivalent to Ofcom's general public. The useful bit for UK amateurs is Chapter 8, which contains tables of safe distance for common antennas, including verticals, dipoles, G5 RVs, Wyndhams, Yagis, and long wires, but not inverted Ls or inverted Vs. The dimensions given are in feet, and one meter is three and a quarter feet, and you can download it from their website without paying any money. The ARRL book, chapter eight, consists of a large number of tables calculated for different antenna types on different bands at different heights above ground. To use it, you first find the table for your antenna with the correct height on the correct band. You go down the power column until you find the next power level above that of your station. And then you go right to the height above ground where the general public could be exposed. If you follow the approach of the RSGB calculator, that will be six feet or 1.8 meters above ground. If the uncontrolled column contains a zero, that means that no horizontal clearance either side of the antenna is required. And we'll see in this case that even at 1.5 kilowatts, a 40 meter dipole 20 feet above ground never requires clearance at the six foot height level. And at the 12 foot height level, you actually need a kilowatt before you have to provide a horizontal exclusion zone. If you cannot find a pre-calculated model for your antenna, then you need to prepare your own E field and H field maps to understand what, if any, exclusion zones are needed. To use NEC, you need to understand a little bit about how it works. NEC splits up the antenna into wire segments and plates. You add a voltage or current source and inductors or capacitors to segments as required to simulate the feed point and any matching components like loading coils or an ATU. The software will then break up the plates into a grid of wires. It will calculate the current and voltage in each segment. Once it knows the current and voltage, it will calculate the electric and magnetic fields from each segment due to the current and voltage in them. It will then calculate the secondary currents, the parasitic currents that these fields induce in every other segment. And it will keep doing this until the difference between successive attempts is small enough. At that point, it has a complete map of the currents and voltages in the antenna and the electric and magnetic fields around the antenna, which can be used to produce near field and far field plots. To use NEC, you first of all use an editor, which could be a text editor or a graphical program to create a model of your antenna in terms of X, Y, and Z, horizontal, left and right, and vertical coordinates, and processing instructions, for example, the frequency range to be studied, or whether to produce a near field or far field plot, and if it's near field, the area to be plotted. Those instructions take the form of a text file, which is fed into the NEC program. And you can also view the model in a 3D viewer so that you can see that it is right before you take time to process it. 
The NEC program will produce text files that can be displayed as a far field pattern, an SWR plot, a near field pattern or map, and also the component data needed to match the antenna to the transmission line impedance that you have specified. Once you have converted your antenna and its surroundings to a set of coordinates, you can then start the NEC modeling process. The way I do it is to first of all run frequency sweeps and adjust the matching components for the maximum real current in the antenna at the desired frequency. Uh, and by looking at the impedance effectively, it will show like 77.9 minus J16.7 ohms. In this example, the aim is to get the J part as small as you possibly can to tune out the reactants, which is what an ATU or loading coil would do. You then run a far field pattern to check that it matches theory for the antenna type as a sanity check. That takes much less time to run than the near field plots, so allows you to avoid wasting time on something that won't ultimately work. And finally, you generate first the E and then the H field patterns. The E field takes about a third of the time to compute as the H, so you only do H when you're sure everything is right. You set the scale limit, which is the pink end of the scale to the ICNIRP limit for the frequency in use. This one was six meters, so it's 62 volts per meter. And you then navigate the plot using the arrow keys to find the maximum extent of the field and take a screenshot. And that is your E field map in this case and same deal exactly for the H field map. Most amateur free implementations of NEC are based on the NEC2 code, which was the last free version released by Lawrence Livermore in the 1980s. The number of wire segments is fixed, so you are limited to the complexity of surfaces modeled as wire grids. The number of grid points is fixed when the software is compiled in for NEC2, which is the version I use. It's 160,000 three-dimensional grid points, boxes if you like, which limits the area that can be plotted at high resolution for near field. The minimum segment length is 1 1,000th of a wavelength which can cause issues, particularly modeling things like gamma matches in HF antennas or folded dipole elements. The minimum separation between wires and ground is also 1 1,000th of a wavelength, which makes it difficult to model an insulated coax or radials lying on the ground. So you have to model them higher up than they really are. Burying them is better anyway for EMF, and it's best for them to be one fiftieth of a wavelength underground, in which case you can simply remove them from the model. Spurious results are generated where large and small wires join, so you will see sort of strange lines of electric and magnetic field extending from the joint. And spurious high fields are generated at 90 degree bends, I think because of a divide by zero in the software. So you should always model corners as two or three segments in an arc to avoid this, although you can hit the 1 1,000th wavelength segment length as a problem doing that. No wires may be under or pass through the ground, so you can't model buried radials, and you can't model a coax that is emerging from the ground after a buried run. The driven segment may not have one end grounded, so you always have to model the feed point a small distance above ground. So you put a minimum length segment, one one thousandth of a wavelength below the driven segment in vertical antennas to get around that. 
and wires may join only at their end so you can't model T junctions as two wires you always have to do it as three wires with a common junction NEC represents antennas as surfaces or lines bounded by coordinates in the X, Y, and Z dimensions. This is an example using the editor from 4NEC2. Uh, you can do it in Notepad, but it is much harder. At least 4NEC2 prompts you what you need to put in and then generates the underlying text file to feed to NEC for you. This is the equivalent text file for my model of the lightweight with its six meter mast. Uh, so you can see that it consists of a text file. Each line begins with a two letter code saying what it represents. So CM is a comment, C is the end of the comment, SP is a surface, SC is a continuation, the second line of a surface. And you can have comments after a single quote at the end of the line. The 3D viewer in 4NEC2 allows you to visualize the geometry that you have created and see that it is what you thought it was before proceeding to simulation. Having now modelled many antennas for my own station and for other local amateurs, I've not really had any huge surprises. The real world separations are always less than Ofcom and RSGB spreadsheet limits. The inverted L antennas behave like verticals near the feed point. Uh, so you can use vertical tables from ARRL to understand the exclusion zones required. Because of Table 8 in ICNIRP 2020, the HFE field is always the limit below 10 megahertz. I've never tried a loop antenna, so it might be different for a magnetic loop, but certainly for anything with open ends, the E field really is all you need to plot because it will be bigger than the H field. Typical general public separations are one to two meters from voltage maxima depending on power. Dipole ends are the worst case for overhead antennas. Above ground radials are the worst case for vertical and inverted L antennas with counterpoises. An end fed half wave feed point is about the same as an end in terms of E-field. At the end of the day, it is a dipole end. It is a high voltage node. It is an end point. Above ground coax, masts and power cables all act as parasitic radiators, even if they are grounded at the ends. And that is worse if they are comparable in size to the radiating elements, because then they are effectively forming parasitic radiators like the non-driven elements of a Yagi. You should always feed NEC the peak power below 10 megahertz and use the RSGB calculator to get the correct average above 10 megahertz. Buried ground wires and radials are safe to ignore if they are more than a 50th of a wavelength under the surface. And the ground type that you select in your NEC model is critical. So you can get huge differences in feed point impedance, for example, and therefore antenna current going from dry sandy ground to uh, waterlogged ground or wet or damp fertile ground. This is the result of an NEC model for my inverted V dipole on 80 meters at 250 watts PEP. The center is eight meters off the ground. The ends are four and a half meters above ground. I used a fertile ground model, which represents typical North Suffolk land. And it has a 50 ohm feed. The wires are slightly over long for the frequency I was modeling. 
so it required a 700 picofarad series capacitance at the feed point to match. Looking at both the E and H field plots, we can see a horizontal line which is spurious. It's caused by the sharp corners at the end of the horizontal feed segment going to the downward sloping radiating segment. But because it's well off the ground and not real, we can not concern ourselves with it for separation distance. What matters is the bottom of the E field at the ends. Uh, and we find that the pink 83 volts per meter contour stops at three meters off the ground, which is 1.2 meters clear from the 1.8 meter head height used in the RSGB calculator. Uh, the H field is only one grid square either side of the wire, uh, which is 25 centimeter grid, 0.25 meters or about 10 inches. So nothing to worry about at all. The next model we'll look at is a top band base loaded vertical eight meters tall with four five meter radials, which is a design I've used in the past for field days. I've used 30 watts PEP input at 1.9 megahertz. That gives a 1.65 to 1 SWR with a 90 microhenry loading coil at 1.2 meters above the ground and the feed point is actually also a bit above the ground. I used a half meter grid. It requires 2.5 meters clearance around the vertical at two to three meters above ground and 0.5 meters either side of the radials. It's probably actually a bit less than that, but the smallest I can see is one grid square. So this antenna probably would require some level of fencing or other barriers to be used safely in a public demo after the license condition is in force. Uh, you could probably mitigate that by using two radials rather than four so that the area of the exclusion zone is much less uh, or preferably by using a dipole or putting it the other side of a fence from the general public. This model is an antenna that I looked at for a friend of mine in North Suffolk. It's an inverted L set up as an end fed quarter wave for top band with a direct feed or an end fed halfway for 80 meters with a 49 to 1 unun feed. The feed point is at the opposite end of the antenna from the station and it's supported on composite poles comprising 6 meters of metal and 5 meters of fiberglass at each end. The coax is on the ground directly under the horizontal part of the inverted L. And I've modeled that driven with 50 watts. Uh, because we're below 10 megahertz, it's only the peak power that matters. And the required separation was found to be 0.7 meters at 2.7 meters above ground around the vertical wire and half a meter around either side of the coax on the ground, uh, which could probably be resolved quite easily by burying it and putting a small fence or some spiky plants around the base of the inverted L. The original NEC2 was a text-based program, which is free public domain software. It was written in Fortran for mainframes, but of course, our modern PCs are much faster than the mainframes when it was written. Antenna descriptions and instructions for analysis are text files and the outputs are text tables. So it's 
fairly essential to have graph paper if you're going to use it. It handles wires and plates in free space or above ground. NEC4 is the current Lawrence Livermore offering. It's export controlled. A license has to be paid for at $110 before you can download it from LLNL. It adds primarily support for wires under and passing through ground. Mininec was an independent implementation of the same maths for the original IBM PC. I actually have a five and a quarter inch floppy set somewhere uh, that is no longer, as far as I know, widely used. There are a number of free programs which provide a graphical editor for the input text files and graphical viewers for the results around the NEC2 core. The ones that I know of are for NEC2 by Ari Vures, which is the one that I have chosen to use. That uses the NEC2D core calculator, which is the most capable form of NEC2. It adds a Windows input file editor and multiple output display programs and builds the ground model grids automatically and can do matching automatically. So I like it. ESNEC by W7EL also uses the core NEC2 calculator with graphical input and output. It comes as a free demo version which can handle 20 segments or 500 if opening files signed by the ARRL. So it was designed originally for use with ARRL book uh, support CDs. The base version of the full program is $99 and the pro version which you need for near field plots is $525 for the standard version or 625 with a version that will use NEC4, although you have to separately get the NEC4 code from Lawrence Livermore for another $110. So the real price is 735. The license for ESNEC is included with some ARRL books. MMANA GAL by JE3HHT, DL1 PBD, and DL2 KQ is similar to 4NEC2, but the free version lacks near field plotting, which is needed for EMF, and the pro version is 139 euros. Uh, I think most people use MMANA GAL or 4NEC2, at least in Europe. Because I'm a cheapskate, I use 4NEC2. Thank you very much for listening to the end of this presentation. The slides that follow are for information and reference only, so won't have a voiceover.